So in understanding zinc finger nucleases, um, we perhaps need to look further back to what other enzymes cut um, DNA sequences, specific DNA sequences, uh, and whether we could modify them or not. So obviously, um, restriction enzymes um, exist in lots of prokaryotes, and we have a large catalogue of these enzymes which will cut a specific sequence. And the idea was to try and modify those enzymes. So by understanding them, creating crystal structures of them, doing lots of mutagenesis on them, potentially we can take an enzyme that cuts sequence X and persuade it to cut sequence Y specifically. But actually most restriction enzymes cannot be readily adapted to cleave new sequences. Um, in general, they've got very short recognition sequences, which is not helpful. They, they'll cut many, many, many times in the genome and, and not cut unique sequences. And when you persuade them to cut another sequence, they cut, they cut them very, very weakly. Um, so really, that wasn't um, a route to develop a genome editing. However, there's a class of enzymes, the type 2 S restriction enzymes, which are quite interesting. An example is the enzyme FOK1, FOK1. And these type 2 S restriction enzymes have separate cleavage and DNA recognition domains. And importantly, the cleavage domain has no specificity and can work on its own. It just needs to be recruited to the, um, the DNA. So for example, here in the case of FOC1, which functions as a dimer, that's an important uh, feature of FOC1, it's a dimeric protein. So it's two molecules of the same protein in green and in blue here. And this domain is the DNA recognition domain. Um, FOC1 binds this particular sequence, GGATG. And then the cleavage domain is here. And a key feature uh, with this type 2 S restriction enzymes is they tend to bind in one place and cut a specific distance away. And the sequence that they cut, it doesn't matter. It can cut out all the sequences here. So type 2 S restriction, restriction enzymes are really useful in, in synthetic biology um, for, for, for lots of different techniques. But in the case of genome editing, we can take this cleavage domain, which will only function as a dimer, and add it on to another DNA binding domain. So we've got the cleavage part, we need the DNA binding part. And the concept was to fuse this catalytic domain of FOC1 onto a different DNA recognition domain. And when you look through the, the genomes of, of mammals, the most common DNA binding domain out there is the zinc finger domain. So for example, there's nearly 1500 human genes that have got zinc finger motifs. Um, um, and there's a large family of genes that contain a certain kind of zinc finger called the cis2, his2 or, or c2h2 zinc finger domain. And these domains, which I'll show you on the next slide, have got a very simple beta beta alpha fold um, and follow um, a very common um, amino acid motif. So these were discovered in 1985 and zinc finger domains were heavily studied in the 1990s and from this very substantial amount of work a DNA recognition co uh, code emerged um, from comparing the, the protein um, amino acid sequence of zinc finger domains and the DNA, DNA sequence that they specifically bound to. So if we look here, um, here's a crystal structure of uh, zinc finger proteins bound um, to DNA uh, and so they bind to normal B DNA and the zinc finger domains um, interdigitate or poke into the major groove of DNA uh, and all these zinc finger domains look like so. You've got an alpha helix and, and two beta sheets here and it's all held together with uh, a, a molecule of zinc hence the name zinc finger and then there are these specific residues on the alpha helix and on this beta turn here, which are the ones which bind to DNA. And depending on, on which amino acid, 
in the, uh, as you can see in this table, is in which position um, in, in this triplet here will determine which nucleotide is bound. And so, you know, you could actually look up through this table and, and, and create on paper which ideal proteins would bind to your sequence of interest. And indeed, this is possible. So you can then create zinc finger nucleases. So zinc finger nucleases are where you've got an array of zinc finger proteins, usually three or four. Each zinc finger binds to three bases. So in the case of four zinc fingers, it's binding to 12 bases. Now, as I said before, FOC1 only functions as a dimer. So you need to make two of these proteins. So you've got to assemble two proteins. So of four zinc fingers with a FOC1 cleavage domain at the C-terminus. And FOC1 needs six bases of space um, to bind to and cleave. So your target sites are these 12 bases, there's a gap, and then these 12 bases. And there are tools to help you um, design these. Um, so key features of zinc finger nucleases is, is that the cleavage domain has no sequence specificity, so you can cut what, whatever you want to. Um, you do need to make two uh, ZFN proteins, but this does increase sequence specificity, so you've now got 24 bases of specificity, which is pretty good. There are mutants of the FOC1 domain that were developed um, which are obligate heterodimers. So there's a left FOC1 mutant and there's a right FOC1 mutant. And what this means is that if one of these, uh, let's say this left ZF, um, ZFN protein bound at an off-target site through its 12 bases, it wouldn't be able to uh, homodimerize with itself and therefore cut that off-target site. So by creating obligate heterodimers, you're really restricting the possibility of ZFNs cutting off target. You do still get some off target acti activity, but it's greatly reduced. The four times zinc finger domains is about as good as it gets. Um, longer arrays generally don't work. Um, so you're looking at 24 bases of specificity uh, at best. Um, Assembling zinc finger arrays now is quite straightforward because there are wonderful um, synthetic biology tools out there to, to join fragments of DNA together quickly in cells. The real problem with zinc finger nuclease is, is the vast majority of zinc finger domains do not function very well when assembled together in these arrays for, for reasons that are not fully understood. So um, the best approach is to take a sort of mass action approach. And so the company Sangamo, based in California, and, and, and you can buy products licensed from Sigma, um, they had found um, zinc finger arrays that function well. And I think these are pairs of zinc fingers, and they've got pretty much every possible combination of pairs. And they found that these pairs are happy to be joined to each other. So they can create sets of four zinc finger domains for most sequences very quickly on a robotic platform and therefore create functional ZFNs quite quickly. And so a lot of those function well. Um, but for ordinary groups assembling them themselves in labs, it, it, it really was quite a, a painful process because um, the majority of ZFNs you made just didn't function uh, anywhere near as well as they should have done on paper. However, if you've got a zinc finger nuclease that binds well and is specific, it's a, it's a superb tool for genome editing. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with zinc finger nucleases. Um, it's just that they're difficult to make if you don't have one of these um, huge assembly platforms available to you. Um, a key advantage of zinc finger nucleases is over all the methods that, that follow, um, uh, which I, I describe in this lecture, um, is that ZFNs are quite small, so they're much easier to d deliver into cells and tissues than some of the uh, more advanced tools that are used later on. So they certainly do have their place in genome editing, um, although you'll find in the modern era um, not many people use them. 
So ZFNs were first successfully used for genome editing in 2003. Uh, they've been used in many species for a, a very wide variety of edi editing applications. And a lot of the genome editing strategies and approaches that, that we know and use today were developed using ZFNs at first. Um, so some of the foundation papers that are out there all use ZFNs, so another reason for knowing about them. Uh, there are over 20 ZFN-based genetic therapies uh, that are going through different stages of clinical trials. Um, so they have their place, um, but the, they were slow to make. Um, there was a low chance of them functioning well, um, particularly when uh, created in, 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 in most standard research laboratories. And a big breakthrough came in 2009 when the DNA recognition code of a different protein domain family was solved. Um, and that leads us on to learning about talons in the next section. Thanks for watching. Let us know in the comments below what you thought of it. Um, please give us a like and certainly think of subscribing. And we've got a lot more content on this channel, which you can see uh, in the playlists coming up. Thanks.